welcome on behalf of the Dino Global Entrepreneurship Center. We have two amazing guests, and of course, we also have Dean Harden. So, uh, Dr. Harden, why don't you start? And Mark, please welcome. It's such an honor to have you here. And Deepak, thank you so much for connecting all the way from Bangkok. And we have Mark in New York. We are in Miami. So this is a fantastic group, very international. And uh, thank you to everybody who's connecting. We know we have guests from Asia. We have uh, our students, of course, from Florida International University. The truth of the matter is by the time I take uh, the time here to introduce our, our guests here, uh, we may not need any more time anyway because <laughs> they have such uh, a long history of success uh, in business and in creating partnerships uh, and in doing a lot of, um, a lot of things community and thinking about what the future should be and how we should all live together. So uh, the first one I'm going to uh, introduce is uh, Deepak Ori. Deepak has just authored a book, A Bridge Too Far, which outlines uh, basically his uh, business career starting as a child and understanding how to create uh, partnerships with people, networks, set goals, understand that we fail and then we overcome failure. I think one of the things that we all recognize uh, as people who deal with entrepreneurship is that failure is part of what we see every day. Uh, and failure is a learning experience. So it's a great book, uh, Bridge Too Far, where creativity meets innovation. Uh, I've read it and I enjoy doing it because uh, perseverance, uh, I mean, you have to have good ideas, but you have to persevere. No one's going to believe you until it happens. But let me give you a little bit about Deepak. He is the founder and CEO of Laboa Hotels and Resorts. Uh, he's an award-winning entrepreneur. He has changed hospitality, especially in Asia and in Thailand. Uh, he has uh, uh, and runs uh, hotels in Thailand that are uh, two-star Michelin-rated hotels with a focus on luxury. So part of what his background is is related to uh, creating luxury experiences for people across uh, all areas and in all locations. I think we all uh, like to feel that we know what luxury is, but it's always great to hear Deepak talk about it because his take on luxury is a little bit different than some of the ones that are focused more on materialism or simple physical presence. It's experiential, which is what do you get when you combine all the attributes that we might uh, be focused on, whether it's visual, whether it's what, how do we smell the food, what is good, and how do we bring that all together in, in luxury. Um, he has been uh, rated as one of the 100 most influential people in the hospitality industry. Uh, I have a two-page uh, CV on Deepak. I know him personally, uh, and I know that's uh, uh, kind of the minimum, but I would like to point out that he uh, gives back to the university community he has lectured at uh, the IIM schools uh, in India, including in Bangalore, uh, Syed, Columbia University, Stern School of Business, MIT, and Harvard. He is our executive in residence at the Pino Global Entrepreneur Center at FIU. So he is giving back to us. He's worked with, I, with our cyber team, which is our Center for International Business Education and Research. Uh, he and Dr. Petrosik uh, were key to a uh, luxury incubator program that we started uh, and had our first class. Uh, so all I can say is that uh, he is someone that, uh, that uh, talks the talk and walks the walk. Uh, one of the things that he and I most have the fun with is his relationship with the World Happiness Foundation uh, because the world needs to be happy, uh, and we're also uh, working with a uh, FIU will sponsor the World Happiness uh, Festival here in about three weeks here in South Florida. So uh, that's just a brief introduction of Deepak, and I'll speak a little bit with regard to Mark. I think a lot of people know Mark uh, Laurie uh, because of his entrepreneurship, primarily in what you might even call consumer focused logistics and entrepreneurship related to uh, the internet. Some of you or many of us are, are well aware that one of his companies, jet.com, 
was sold to Walmart as Walmart was trying to get into the internet space. Uh, probably a little bit more exciting to me is that uh, he was the CEO and, and ran the company that actually uh, was just Quidzy that was the parent of many uh, email, email, e-commerce sites uh, such as soap.com, wag.com, and perhaps uh, more importantly, diapers.com. And there have been a lot of things on, on some of these and how automated some of the warehouses are uh, and just a fascinating take on that. Uh, if you're into sports, you recognize that uh, Mark is uh, one of the owners of the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves and the Minnesota Lynx. Uh, he works a lot with one of our uh, uh, Miami uh, residents, uh, Alex Rodriguez, uh, and basically is a serial entrepreneur uh, and um, has, has been very successful uh, since he uh, came out of uh, Bucknell University uh, which is where he studied business and economics, and which formed the framework for uh, for his success. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Deepak and to Anna. I want to thank our panelists, uh, and I want to recognize the fact that we have two of the uh, stars of not just Miami scene, but a global scene with regard to entrepreneurship and positivity. Uh, and creativity. I don't know if they'll get into it, but Mark also is working in a futuristic uh, scenario through um, his newest company, which is uh, related to uh, to creating the built environment and how it ties in to create the best built environment for uh, for all of us. You know, we live, we breathe, we have fun. Uh, but that's all dictated by the constraints that we have in our built environment and how we run things. So, you know, I I think we're probably ready to go now, and uh, I'm excited to hear what everyone has to say. It'll be a fun time. Thank you, Dean Harden. Uh, sorry, I'm taking over, Dr. Anna. With Please, go ahead. Uh, th that's a great introduction. I think I would not be able to introduce myself like that, so I really appreciate that. And Mark, uh, welcome. So I'm just taking the center stage because I'm part of FIU. So, so I will have that privilege. And they told me that you have to look good. So we were wondering <laughs> how, how we can make you look good. And then Dr. Anna Pitrasek came up with a genius idea that why don't you be on a panel with Mark and we don't have to work hard and Mark will look good. So, <laughs> so that's the whole plan. <laughs> I, I'm a foodie and I was, me along with other people who are wondering what wonder is all about. So Mark, why don't we start with wonder? Because yeah, you, are, you are a wonderful person and you have created wonders. But we start with wonder, which is a your newest venture. Yeah, sure. It is my newest venture. I, I uh, you know, became the full-time CEO back in October. So I'm, I'm back in it 24-7, you know, back playing on the field. Um, we started the company a few years back and, you know, raised hundreds of millions of dollars, invested in culinary engineering and food science to be able to deliver a truly elevated at home dining experience. So think next generation of the delivery aggregators, the, the Ubers, the DoorDash, you know, it's um, meant to be super high quality food delivered across many different cuisines, all hot, great prices on time, fast. Um, and the way we pulled this off was we went out and found the best restaurants and chefs around the country. Um, Tejas Barbecue from Texas, uh, Bobby Flay Steak, uh, DeFaro Pizza from Brooklyn. We got uh, 30 different cuisines and restaurants. We buy the rights to them. We do the culinary engineering and we put all 30 restaurants in a single fixed location so that the customer can order across all 30 restaurants, get it at the same time under 30 minutes, piping hot. So high quality food, fast, hot, uh, with, 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 great, um, with great chefs and restaurants behind it. We're fully vertically integrated. We cook the food, we deliver the food, um, and it's, it's all an end-to-end an -end sort of uh, system that we've built. That's it in oh, a nutshell, that, really. That, that's great, Mark. So I'm a foodie. Uh, 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 that's what I call myself, okay? <laughs> so I call myself that I'm a foodie. Okay, so so so. Okay, I'm but be Deepak, before but before I leave, that's what you guys may be foodies, but I'm at the South Beach Wine and Food Festival in person. <laughs> Have fun. Whole festival supports FIU School of Hospitality, 
So I think I'm the winner today, no matter how successful you guys are with this business. <laughs> uh, no, you are. You're always the winner, Dean Harden. Let me tell oh. you that. <laughs> so I'll, I'll see you there free. tomorrow, coming down tomorrow. Oh, I envy all of you. So, so rub it in, okay? So, 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 so I'm a foodie, and I just want to understand. And I'm, I call myself a luxury person, but my definition of luxury is very different. Uh, but when I googled you, I think we relate to each other. So, in how you think, the only difference is you are a billionaire, and I'm yet to be a millionaire. So, so that that's the difference. Uh, but rest, everything matches. So, my point is. What difference you're creating in your wonder that if I'm ordering from any other app that I will choose you and I'll have a better experience that I will say that two days in a week I'm going out and eating and one day I'm going to order from wonder. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is not to replace dine out. If you want to go to a restaurant, great. It's, it's meant to replace your delivery at home dining experience. And so um, we believe that we're the only ones that could offer 30 restaurants in a single checkout that'll be delivered under 30 minutes, piping hot, super high quality. That doesn't, that doesn't exist really in the existing delivery platforms because they're not vertically integrated. They're basically hooking up with existing restaurants and it's very difficult to get the timing right. Um, and certainly, you know, you're not going to be able to order across 30 restaurants and get it in, in a single delivery to your door. So that's where we really stand out. Uh, and that's also, really yeah. Also the quality of the food. So we've found the best restaurant in every cuisine across the country, whether it be chaos barbecue from Texas, the clam shack from Maine, Nancy Silverton pizzeria, Moza from LA, Fred's meat and bread from Atlanta. We found the best restaurants. We buy the rights and then we bring them all to, you know, today, New York city but in the future, all around the world. Wow, that, that's really amazing. So maybe, what was the thought behind that? The thought was uh, very simply that uh, I was watching, you know, back in 2010, the, the delivery of food was only about 10 million a year from these aggregators. And uh, in the last 12, 13 years, it's now boomed to 100 billion. And we think it's gonna go to 600 billion by 2035. So the younger generation is definitely proving um, that they want to uh, put a premium on convenience and, and really don't uh, want to cook if they don't have to. That's kind of the, the, the way the, you know, where the puck's headed and just felt like the delivery aggregators today um, was not the future. It was a very subpar experience and yet people were still paying for it. It's, you know, cold food, late, um, not great customer service. It's a, a uh, third party uh, intermediary it kind of feels like the early days of e-commerce with the marketplaces. And then Amazon came around and offered a really robust first party experience where they controlled it end to end. And we know the story there. I think there's an opportunity to completely disrupt the food and Bev and delivery market with a end to end first party experience. That's, that's very elevated relative to the marketplaces. And that's what we feel like we've got. Um, now we're only, you know, launched our, our first location. So we've got a lot of a lot to prove, but um, we feel really good about the asset that we built over the last few years. Uh, it's really amazing. So, so, so in luxury space, if we have to say that Wonder is in food, how would you relate Wonder to any other brand in luxury, like in merchandising or clothing? Which brand you relate Wonder with? Whether it could be, means you can choose the brand. Yeah, it's 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 an it's elevated relative to its category. So I think. Sort of like, uh, I guess the best analogy might be what Starbucks did to coffee. So it, it is a, you know, taking what was a, you know, an or ordinary experience and making it extraordinary in, in a very common category. We're doing that across every cuisine type, whether it be steak, Japanese, Chinese, Mexican, Italian, uh, Middle Eastern, Greek. We've literally got uh, something for, for everybody in, in every cuisine. Um, and um, that's what really, um, differentiates that's just like elevated and across the board. So, what's the price point? Price point is going to be uh, exactly what you would expect uh, to get in a restaurant of that type. So, we've got all price points a Bobby Flay steak, four dollar signs, down to Fred's meat and bread, one dollar sign, and everything in between. So, the price to value 
um, is, is better than what you get on a delivery aggregator where they're paying, charging all these fees, all these extra fees. We don't uh, have to charge as many fees because we're vertically integrated. Um, and it's our, it's our food margin and we're doing the delivery. The other thing um, is that we're, because we've got 30 restaurants in a single location, we don't have to travel in New York City more than six blocks in any direction, which means much faster delivery, but also a lot lower cost, um, which allows us to have lower prices. So. Uh, so it's only right now in New York City? Right now it's, it's in uh, New Jersey, one location in Jersey, in New York City, but the New York City is, is the model going forward. The location I, and then there's going to go nationwide, right? That's the idea, yeah. That's it. Can I ask uh, what, so, so are the restaurants involved in the, how, how does the, the, the prep work? How does the, I mean, I, I think it's a great concept. I can order from 30 different restaurants. Uh, so my wife can order from one, someone can order from another. It's like a food court that I can bring to my house. I guess that's the way I, I'm interpreting it. Um, is that, am I, do I have it right or am I just? Yeah, that, that, that's correct. And the way we were able to pull that off to put 30 restaurants in, in 3,000 square feet is that all of the prep of the food and the heavy lifting is done in a massive central commissary kitchen, 100,000 square feet, very far from the actual physical location that's in like, you know, New York City. And all the prep is done there. So when you send the food to these physical locations, um, you can get a lot of restaurants in there because you're not having to do all the prep and raw materials and do all that stuff in there. So it's sort of like um, the way a restaurant would have all the prep pre-dinner. And then once dinner service hits, they're just moving really fast in a really small space. That's what we're able to do across the so 30 restaurants. Cuts down your real estate costs. You don't have to have the, the real estate in the prime location. You can move some of that prep <clears> space to yeah. a much lower price point and then you know, be in that location that's going to, I mean, so you can drive the cost down that, that allow you to have that margin without charging all the, the high fees associated with many of the delivery, uh, the apps there. So, uh, that's exactly so right. okay. Yeah. Okay. So are you we not need, getting into hotels and restaurants, right, Mark? What's that? Physical hotels and restaurants. You're not getting into that, right? No, it, it, this, it's a physical location. With very no, I know domain. this one wonder, but in the future you're not getting into hotels and restaurants, right? No, no, no. It's it, it's it's oh, a then, limited. Then, okay, then we are friends because I don't want you to take my job, so I'll send you my book, The Bridge okay. Not Too Far. <laughs> so then we are friends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to send you my book. Okay. So so my point is, if I have to do something like that, like a, as a consumer, and order from Wonder, I, and and you're a tech genius, I mean. Besides tech, you are a genius, okay? But you are into tech. You are into technology. How the experience can be enhanced through technology when people are ordering the food? So maybe that is something in the pipeline, or that is something you're thinking about. Because you got thirty restaurants. Five years down the line, three years down the line, somebody will come with twenty restaurants. Somebody will come with thirty. Somebody will come with forty restaurants. So, so to have and to maintain that position, you are thinking about enhancing the experience. Something yeah, I mean, that yeah, we're constantly investing. It's both investing in the software. So we've built all our own technology. So for example, you mentioned technology. We've built a system where we time the cooking of the food with the courier. So if the courier we know is 12 minutes away from the location, but it only takes seven minutes to cook, we wait five minutes. Then we cook the food so the food is ready right when the courier gets there. So you don't waste any labor and the food doesn't sit hot. So there's, there's that whole technology. There is the batching timing of the food. So if you order from three different restaurants and they take three different times to cook, that it fires everything at the right time so it all finishes at the same time. We're investing a lot in that, in that sort of technology, workforce planning technology, um, things like that. And then on the culinary engineering side, that's where the real separation comes. It's investing in, in how do you cook higher quality food faster. And so when we started, it was four minutes to cook a really high quality pizza. We have that down to 85 seconds. A uh, Bobby Flay, filet mignon, perfect temp steak, medium rare. We'll get that, get that cooked in five minutes um, with very lightly trained labor. So it's those, uh, in, you know, in, in that, at that innovation that's really driving the uh, the separation from, from from folks that are thinking about coming into this 
Just if I'm your customer, example, hypothetically, and I'm ordering $300 of food per week for, say, almost six months, so it is $1,800, and suddenly I don't order for two months. Do I get any prompts? Do I get any messages? Or do I get free cookies or something for me to come back? Or, or you're wondering what is happening with me? Is there anything oh, like that? Yeah, we, we, we examine the cohorts and the individual behavior of every customer. And there's certain prompts that happen depending on how they order. Ordering frequently, you take a gap, then we'll try and get you back. If you don't come back with a, with a, with a straight, you know, communication, we'll go to an offer. And yeah, there's this a whole program to try and uh, keep people, um, you know, to, to continue to come back. And if there's a reason why you didn't come back, um, was it something that went wrong? How do we make it right? Like we, we we're meticulous about that. Uh, every customer matters. And we've been, we managed to get a net promoter score around 70, which is unheard of oh. in food. And we're, oh, we're just going to- Okay, that's excellent. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so. uh, you are a real genius. I'm very, I'm very happy that you're not getting into hotels and restaurants so so I can breathe. So- <laughs> No, <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> that's so anything you want to talk about, because it's our discussion, then I'll talk about our business, what we do at Labua, but I just want to hear anything else you want to talk about because you have done so many things and most of the people, 90% people have logged in to listen to you, not to me. But they told me to switch to the camera and the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so anything else you want to talk about? Uh, no, I listen, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm wanting to, to learn as well on this conversation and, and uh, you know, I'm so happy to, to to meet all you and have you know feel honored to to be here to share share what I've learned. I've been through a lot, of, you know, a lot of startups and a lot of a uh, lot of hard lessons. You know. So every time I'm in New York, I promise you, not because you're here, because I'm too impressed with what you're doing. So I'm going to order one evening wonder food. So <laughs> so so that's what I'm going to do. So I think everyone who's hearing, they should go and try because Mark always do something which is truly amazing. Now tell me something about one area where you are doing the tech company, sold it to Walmart, one area you're doing food. How did you get into MBA? MBA, what, uh, I was always, MBA yeah, it was always a uh, childhood dream. You know, I grew up in, in Staten Island, New York. Um, parents had me when they were very young. And I was the first person to go to school, uh, you know, college. Um, and um, it, it was just like, you know, childhood dream you know being a kid growing up you know without any money and and just playing street ball and 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 sports and things and it was always one of those things like wouldn't that be so cool to to one day own a sports team that was like an unrealistic dream at the time and um, then you grow up reality hits you know you go to college you get a job I started working in the back office of a bank I thought I was going to be on the trading floor and they're like no um, you, you're going to fax basically all day. And uh, I was like, wait a second, this, I thought I was going to, you know, be on the trading floor talking derivatives and trading. Like, no, you're going to be faxing, you know, trade confirms. And that's the way it starts, you know? And so the dream quickly disappears and reality hits. Um, and then I just, with, with a lot of hard work and, and, and some good fortune, um, was able to, you know, become an entrepreneur and, and hit on something um, early, early in my career. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not something that, uh, that was a realistic dream until not that long ago. And then, and then um, it kind of just, the opportunity presented itself and, and A-Rod and I like jumped on it, like immediately. Like from the time we met the owner of the Timberwolves and he said he might be interested in, in selling it. Um, and then 48 hours later, we had signed an LOI and they announced that we're buying the team. It was like, that quick. It was, we didn't have time to really think about it. And uh, had we thought about it, we probably would not have gotten the team. Um, Cause after we found, we found out that multiple parties had deals with the owner and, and um, the deals never happened because they, they, they tried to negotiate. And so one of the big lessons I learned in that was sometimes, you know, the best way to negotiate is not to, no, to not negotiate at all. You know, knowing when to negotiate and when not to, um, is really important. And it's not always the case that you should negotiate. Like some people think on job interviews or things, or it's like, 
oh, they made me this offer. I need to negotiate. Otherwise, it's gonna, I'm going to seem weak or it's not weak. Sometimes it's a sign of strength when you know it's, it's fair and you just basically accept it as is without negotiating. And so for anyone listening uh, now who feeling like when they get presented an offer, they have to uh, negotiate, um, that's not true. And, and it, it often um, are the, the, the people that don't negotiate that are the, the most successful I found in my career, uh, believe it or not. Like it's, it's the people that sort of appreciate, get it, know it's good and jump on it quickly. Um, I had, I had uh, one guy that uh, I'll never forget. Uh, he came in for an interview, um, told him about the job, told him about the company. He was very excited. And I said, I, I uh, really think you're great. And I really want you to, to come work at, at, at Jet. This was Jet.com. I really want you to come work at Jet. Um, and I'd uh, like to make you an offer to come work here. And he said, um, I accept. And I said, well, I haven't told you the salary yet. And he said, uh, salary, I know it's going to be fair. I just want to get on this bus and I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And so I'm all in. If the salary is fair, I'm in and I know it will be. And so I accept. I was like, wow, like, like it wasn't about the money. He just wanted to get on the bus and a guy, you know, it, it worked out and um, it was a really smart decision, but um, it's, uh, it's not always like that. You know, people feel like, you know, sometimes it's correlated with, with, you know, um, you know, people just feeling like they need to, they need to negotiate just for the sake of it. So, so was, I, I consider myself, Mark, after listening to you. So for everyone who's listening, whenever you're going to work for Mark, never negotiate. So <laughs> that's the first rule and you'll get hired and you will never get fired. Okay. So for me, uh, <laughs> I'm a master of few things in life. Uh, it's a very proud thing to say, but I'm the master of the things which people don't believe in. So I'm a master of dreaming. So I like to sleep more than other people because I love to dream. And when I'm awake, I love to work hard to achieve my dreams. So I think more than a negotiation, I think it is all about a dream. And when you see that your dream is just closer to you and you say that, no, I don't want to negotiate. I want this because this is my dream. And that's what that gentleman who came to jet.com and this is what happened with you when you were trying to negotiate to buy that team and you said, I'm not going to negotiate because that was your dream. So, yeah. so, so, so everybody, I think we have two dreamers and that's the difference everyone can see that there's one Mark and that's me, I'm working hard. Mark has already worked hard. So that's what happens when people dream. So both are successful. So, so, so I will say about that, but I, I think I've written that in my book also that, so I teach happiness. So, but I teach happiness on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. So I don't even teach happiness to two people. Do you know why? Why? <laughs> the reason is happiness is very individual. And I don't even teach happiness. I, I, I'm looking for a tech company because I consider myself as a GPS. The happiness is within people. I'm a GPS and I take them to their happiness. It's like when you fly to LA, you go to a, rent a car, you get a GPS, you don't know where you're going. Uh, depending on which voice you like, a woman or a man, they tell you where to go, how to go, and you reach your destination. And I bring people to their happiness. And happiness is very different. So we are going in a topic which is completely unrelated to my turf, so that people see that you're supporting me too, Mark. <laughs> no, it's just a joke. <laughs> so, <laughs> So the idea is that happiness is very different to wellness. Happiness is very different to meditation. Happiness is very different to preparing yourself to focus. Happiness is something which is, which the most happiest people are that they realize where they stand. And sometimes yeah. we as individuals, we do not know where we stand. So I think, what is I think that's that? a great point, Deepak. I, I think it's a great point. And I, I, I found that when, when people have clarity of knowing like what their personal values are, and then they, they live those values in a way that represents what they stand for, that people are happy. 
like either people don't necessarily always go through the exercise. They don't know why they're, why they're unhappy, but it's, it's most of the time it's, I find it's because they're living a life that's not consistent with their values, whether they're being the wrong relationship, the wrong job, they're just not being true to their, to their, to their self and going, I went through an exercise once where I really forced myself to come up with a personal mission statement and, and a set of values. And after I really spent the time to, to figure out what it was that I really stood for and I started to live against that mission and values, I, I you know, became a lot happier. Um, so I think, I think that's a really important exercise for people to go through. That was just my own. Uh, very well said. So I'm going to ask another question, which today in today's world, technology is driving people. Back when I was growing up, or of course you're growing up, but we were in different countries. So, so when I was growing up in India, people were driving the technology, not technology is driving the people. What scenario you would like to see for the future generation, who should drive who? Technology drive people or people drive technology? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's dangerous the other way around. When, when tech starts to drive people, I think that that becomes a dangerous situation. I think people need to leverage technology to do more, to push the limits of what human humanity is capable of. But it, it has to be humans leveraging technology, I think, rather than you know being, being led by it. You know, um, technology shouldn't be the driver, it should be people. Uh, and even in business and startups, like if you if you lead with technology, I think that's where a lot of startups fall down, as opposed to, you know, leading leading with the the, the, the vision, um, and the strategy, and having real clarity, and then using technology to help get you there faster, more efficiently, um, uh, and, and to be able to offer things that uh, that that help you, you know, drive that strategy. I think if it's the other way around, if you start with tech, um, and lead with it, I think that's where you can get upside down. So is simple things are difficult or difficult things are difficult? Difficult, wait, say that again? What? Simple things are difficult or difficult things are difficult? Simple things are difficult or difficult things are difficult? Yeah. That's the question? Yeah. What, what will you choose? Simplicity over complication? Oh, always simplicity. Okay. Always so what simplicity. is more difficult to do? Simplicity or complication? Simplicity. I choose simplicity. Yeah, yeah I mean, how, so do you, why did, how do you make hard why things simple? Word, simplicity is becoming difficult. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, um, you know, I think there's an art in going after very difficult problems um, with simple solutions. It's like the whole idea of it's harder to write a, a short letter than a long letter. It's a similar kind of concept. Like it's, it's it, there's an art uh, and, and a difficulty in making difficult things simple. But that's got to be the goal. How do you? Anytime there's a big, big hairy audacious goal, right? You're looking at it and you're thinking, "Wow, this is, this is very difficult. This is nearly impossible." How do you break it down into its simplest components um, and, and and tackle each of the the simple components? And then when you do that, they start adding up. And suddenly you find yourself um, with the solution to a very difficult problem. So, Mark, uh, 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 I'm a CEO of a company based out of Bangkok, and we have a property. And we do, on a daily basis, 2,400 customers coming to the hotel and coming to our restaurants. But only 285 rooms now. It used to be 357. The other remaining rooms are under renovation. So... So one of the Harvard Business School professor came and said, you're like McDonald's, but you're in a luxury business. Because he said he has never seen a queue like that. And the reason we have been able to achieve that is because we made everything very simple. So few of our restaurants on the rooftop, actually most of our restaurants on the rooftop, some are open air or some are uh, in enclosed space. We opened the first rooftop restaurant in 2003. And that time we said it is the world's tallest al fresco restaurant. 2023, many buildings have become taller than us, but nobody could still build a world's tallest outdoor restaurant. Wow. And 
So I tell you why. And that's a very important thing because that's why I asked you that question of simplicity. People could have made it because they are tall buildings, but everybody is so complicated. They want to make money. And the one thing they think, if it rains or if it snows, or if it is a sandstorm, depending on which country you are, I'm going to lose three months of business or four months of business. So I'm not going to do open air restaurant. We'll do some kind of enclosure that we don't lose that kind of money. And you know what we thought while building that restaurant? We will lose that three months or four months of money, but we will create an ambience and experience that remaining nine months, people will always remember us. So yep. that was the whole difference. I love now, that. Metro Sorry? No, I, I love that. It's, you, you're working backwards from how do you optimize the customer experience in a way that creates separation from the competition, um, which yeah. is, I always like to say brands are created at the extreme and you created a brand that way and you really stood for something that separated you from everyone else. Um, and I would, I would lean toward that solution every time, every day of the week. So, so we are a standalone property uh, in Bangkok and every brand, the, like famous for all the world, every brand is there. Every brand is there, okay? And still they cannot compete with us. Yeah, it makes, it makes and sense. You know why? And you know why? Not because we are genius. Because they think differently or we think yeah. differently. I'll give yeah. an example. We have six bars and four restaurants. Just an example. And all our six bars, the staff uniform is white and black. The white shirt and not even the first button open for everyone, gentlemen and the ladies, and black trousers. And every other place, the bar has got very different kind of dress code for the staff. And do you know why we kept it so simple? Because it's brand, right? No. So the reason we kept it so simple, today the world is metaverse. So we are on... All our restaurants on top of 64th floor. So everyone has to take the elevator. So when they take the elevator, you know what starts working? Your unconscious or a subconscious mind start working. And as soon as they come out of the lift, there are six women, they welcome them in the front. Now, I'll tell you a story. And then we take them to wherever they want to go. So by that time, the and our repeat customers in a luxury segment is 60% which is very, very high. Keeping in mind that 80% of our customers are visiting Thailand. And our repeat customer is 60%. And that is as per the third company, the outside company. The reason being, the metaverse has come today. We created a metaverse. We created a dream. When the people enter, everything around what the customer is seeing is so simple because he is in the elevator with the unconscious mind. He only become conscious when he goes home and he realizes what he has missed and he wants to come back again. Yeah. And that is what we have created. And everything else, we kept it simple. And his experience level goes to a much higher uh, score than our competing properties. So, so that is the power of science. Yeah. Second thing, second thing is how we don't use technology. Most of the rooftop restaurants, you stand in a queue only to buy a ticket so that you go up. The reason most of these places are doing that is because they don't want to lose revenue when people go and look at the view. We look at it very differently. So we have the cameras where all our staff photographs are there. We count is a counter. And we got that idea from the shops because, you know, the shops you enter, you go out, they count how many customers have come in. So we count how many people have come in. We look, we have integrated that with our point of sale system and we see how many people have paid. The remaining people is our training to train our staff not to lose that customer without leaving, without a drink, without charging any money. So sometimes when I go to a place, if there's a queue to buy a ticket, I will not stand in a queue. And if there's a, not a queue, 
that restaurant is not worth visiting. Yep. <laughs> so such a simple thing, and how we have converted such a simple thing into a great experience for a customer by just simply using technology at the background. So we drove the technology rather than technology driving us. Yeah, I love that. So any example you have done in your career, something like that where you have, because everyone knows you, you are the tech guy and everything, where you have used technology in the background rather than upfront and, and enhance the customer experience. Technology in the background. I mean, just everything we do is tech, is technology. So I'm just, you know, trying to give you a good example of using it in the background like that. Um, you know, at, at Jet.com. Okay, so, uh, let me rephrase my question. Technology, yeah, I, I, so people come in before technology, the customers. So what have you done that the customer comes first and technology come later? Well, the customer always, come, always comes first. The technology is always in the background. Um, like I said, just enabling, you know, how do you get food out of wonder, you know, to get to people's doors super hot. Like I said before, the technology in the background is timing when to cook the food based on where the curry is and how long the curry is going to take to get to pick up the food so that it's merged at the perfect time. Like that's technology in the background that's, that's enabling um, you know, customers to get hotter, higher quality food. And so in order to be an innovator, I feel like you want to maximize the amount of time thinking about problems, thinking about the world, connecting dots. I like to talk to people. I like to ask questions. I like to learn, you know, uh, you know, to, to, to experiencing and then spend a lot of time thinking and piecing everything together. Entrepreneurs many times go into a, a completely new business or new industry and they are able to disrupt it where the incumbent players haven't been able to because they they go in naive with no preconceived, you know, can't do this, can't do that. And you just start with a clean slate and, and rethink the problem. Um, and that's- Mark, you just said that you like to ask questions. So why don't you ask me some few questions? I've been asking all, I've been asking you a lot of questions. I don't want to be in trouble. I was told not to ask you a single question. Oh, no. I First of all, I, I love the questions. I think if you know people for who are listening, you know, um, you know, if I were if I were listening to this to this um, um, whatever we're calling this a Zoom podcast sort of situation, like it'd be what are the lessons, what are the pitfalls uh, for people to avoid or or look for? A question I get asked all the time, and I'll ask you, um, what uh, you know if. if if you were going back and telling your 21 year old self a uh, piece of advice now, based on all the experience you've had, what would you, what would you tell that 21 year old? So I'm going to say that I would, I should have met Mark when I was 21 year old. <laughs> and that's the reality because yeah. if I would have Mark, Mark and Mark would have met me, the world would be a little bit different today. So that's what meaning meeting people, connecting with the right people, keeping the influence circle, stronger and not meeting people who are your friends but meeting people who bring you a lot of knowledge who 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 feeds you and that's what i would have done differently great mark i don't want to interrupt but you just mentioned you're writing a book right i'm writing a book yeah something you want to talk about as well what are you writing your book about what is it about it's uh it's sort of like a entrepreneur playbook on how to build a billion dollar business from the back of a napkin. It's sort of like a, not a step-by-step, -step, but sort of like in broad strokes, how to go about it. Um, my, my thinking is that it's harder to build a million dollar business than a billion dollar business. And that's really what the book's about. Um, it's actually, if, if you told me tomorrow, like go out and build a million dollar business, I wouldn't know how to do it because it would mean that I couldn't raise any capital um, because I couldn't offer anyone uh, a good return on capital. So I would be doing it um, without any money. That'd be tough. Like when you're raising a billion dollar business is a function of raising a little bit of money, proving that you did what you said with that, and then raising more money and then proving you can do what you said you're going to do with that amount of money. And you sort of like um, build a foundation and keep keep building off, off the back of it, uh, off the back of institutional venture capital is, is a lot easier than than uh, doing it without venture capital. So that, that's kind of what the book's about. And it walks through 
vision, strategy, how to create an org structure, how to build a culture, how to hire people, how to retain them, how to raise capital, how to pitch venture capitalists. It goes through all that stuff. Okay, so my book is called A Bridge Not Too Far, and my book is about my journey, but with a lot of lessons. So, so I got to know there was a drink called Coca-Cola at the age of six. I got to see at the age of six that the bedrooms can have attached power. And the most naive question or an innocent question I asked that when you get off your bed, do you have to stand in a queue to enter the washroom or you can enter by opening the door? Because I didn't realize that that washroom belongs to you. You can do that. When I was 18 year old studying hotel management, not any other course, hotel management, I learned to pass my exam that broccoli is a green color cauliflower smaller in size. I, <laughs> I learned how to fasten the seat belt on my first plane trip when I was 21 year old. When I was 23 year old, I went to US and I, I was not, I went to Singapore and I was working in a restaurant and a booking came and I took the booking. The booking came from JP Morgan Investment Bank. And I wrote Mr. Morgan two packs at 12 noon for lunch. I didn't realize that Mr. Morgan and JP Morgan are two different things. Of course, Mr. Morgan <laughs> was there many years back, but JP Morgan is a bank. So I wanted to buy something and somebody said, go to 7-Eleven. I said 7 to 11. But my journey is that coming from that humble background where my English was a challenge, the biggest accomplishment is that the 192 pages I have written in my book is all in English. So that's my biggest accomplishment. The second thing is that I survived in this world because I didn't have FOPO. And FOPO is fear of people's opinion. And whenever I had FOPO, I converted that into ROPO, which is respect of people's opinion. And I'll give you one very good example of respecting of people's opinion. So when we opened that rooftop restaurant, and few gentlemen came, like very well-dressed, nice suits and everything, sat down. And they were having, and, and that was the fifth day of our restaurant that I had opened. They were having champagne, caviar and everything, and suddenly it rained. And they all ran away. Not only that they ran away, $8,000 also gone. And that was a sixth day. And, you know, when you start a new venture, that money is a lot of money. Next day, I saw a few guys coming with the umbrellas and wearing jeans and T-shirt. They said, you recognize us? I said, no. He said, we were there yesterday. I said, yes, yes, yes. He said, we want to dine here, but only on one condition. I said, what? He said, we want to pay for the last evening meal. I said, no. He said, take the money and I'm going to give you a lesson. That was 23 years back. You'll remember. So I said, yes. So he taught me two things. He said, first, keep umbrellas in your restaurant because it can rain. Second, when it rains, do a rain check voucher. Meaning you come the food and invite them for two glasses of champagne. So I said, how do I make money? He said, everybody will insist on paying for the food. Until today, not even a single customer Maybe doing 2,400 customers a day. You can calculate 2,400 customers a day into 365 into 20 years. Has not even asked for money when it has been. That was That's great. That was having no FOPO, but having a respect of people's opinion and a customer and implemented it. But it is an art who to listen to and who not to listen to. So who do you listen to, Mark? Who do I listen to? Yeah, I'm very I'm much more simple than that. I don't, you know, I um, I grew up my my grandfather who was a, a role model in my life. He um, called him Big Pop, and uh, he came over from Italy. He worked on the railroad, um, you know, laying railroad tires, and he was the most optimistic, happy person you'll ever meet. He said, "I love my job. It's like working twelve to one in an hour for lunch." And I said, yeah, Pop, but you, you lay railroad tracks down every day. That's like a lot of work and it seems like you'd get bored of that. And he said, no, no, Mark. It's, you know, the relationship I have with my men and we're doing good work. And his value was, was like I mentioned before about your happiness is tied to your values. His value was hard work and, and you know, helping contribute to, to society. He felt like he was really doing good 
good work and it made him happy. And he felt like it wasn't really a job. And he was uh, extremely kind and giving and empathetic. And those values, I think, really rubbed off on me. And so I um, like to believe that, you know, you can be a, a successful leader in business and at the same time, treat people really well and be kind and empathetic. And those are two traits that I carry with me in every company and culture that I create. And it all came from, from Big Pop. Very good. So, uh, so I'm also. Uh, it seems like you have read my book. Okay. So my book is all of, all about value proposition. There's one thing I talk about always, is that the organization in today's world should have a hybrid of principle and rules, not only rules. You know. So mature organizations they leave the principles behind and they become hundred percent rules, and that is what is taking most of the organizations behind. So I believe that. And this is what I like to teach. And that's how I got into experiential learning that principle and the value system should combine with the rule system to create a better and a valuable organization, a organization which stands on a value. And uh, I give you an example of that. They're top hoteliers. If they're listening, they're going to ban me. But that's OK, because I can always come to you, Mark, in case they ban me. So this, they have written the book. And the amount of book they have sold with the amount of business they own is, is a big gap. And why that gap is there, they may own the hotel, they may have run the organization, but what they missed is that they never added value to the people who are working for them. And people never appreciate money. They appreciate what value has been added to me to progress and that is what the world is looking at. How do we add value to this world? What is your take on that? Yeah, I think I'd even take it a step further. I do agree. It's, it's never ultimately about the money. And, uh, you know, people definitely want progress. But I find that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, just want to feel like they're contributing to something bigger than themselves, that they're really using their knowledge, um, their will, their work, work um, effort. To, to help create something that will, you know, be better for society. Like, even though it is about making money, there is, there is this, um, I find this, this human value system that takes over. When you uh, really empower someone and you trust them and you create a really safe, inclusive work environment, that they're going to give you the best that they've got. Um, and, and, and you have a clear mission of, of why they're doing what they're doing. I, I find that's where the magic is. And so I'm definitely really big on, on creating a, a culture that's grounded in a set of values. At Jet, at Wonder, it's, it's trust, transparency, and fairness. I feel like if the company can be really transparent with information and give that to, to the employees and implicitly start from a place of trust and create a really fair, um, inclusive work environment that people feel empowered. And from that empowerment, um, leads to them doing their best work. Um, so it, it's a combination of, of empowerment and also feeling safe that you can bring your your best self to work and do your best work. And that's really been the magic, I think, in, in all my startups. It's not me. You said genius. I'm definitely not a genius. I, I've just you know created an environment where um, a culture where it, it attracts a very diverse um, a population of, of some of the best people in the world that want to come work together to, to have an impact on the world and, um, you know, create a culture that, that really gets the best that they've got to give. And then everything else just happens from there. It's, it's really, it's really the, 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 the foundation, the culture that, that everything uh, good emanates from. So very well said, but I told you genius because I was given the script. <laughs> and they said, if I don't tell you genius, I'm not getting into the next webinar. That was a joke. <laughs> yeah, we, have a, we have to wrap up because the time is... Yeah, I'm wrapping it up. So I've gained, I've gained one thing, Mark, today, and I've lost one thing. So I don't know whether I should be happy about what I've gained or I should be sad about what I've lost. So let me tell you what I've gained and what I've lost. I've gained okay. one person who's adding value to the world as a friend. And what I've lost is a client who could come to me and say, give me happiness because you are a very happy person. So I <laughs> congratulate you on that. 
So <laughs> before we wrap up, I'm going to tell you what is my next agenda. What is what is next on your mind? What is next on your dream? Not on your mind. What is next on your dream? I mean, just in a nutshell, we didn't get a chance to get into this, but but my dream is is to test this new model for society um, with this new city of Tolosa, where it's a more equitable, sustainable future, um, where um, you know people will will basically um, benefit uh, collectively. The citizens of, of Tolosa will benefit collectively as the city appreciates in value because the land will be owned by the citizens, and so. I think we have the ability to offer some of the best social services in terms of medical medical services, education, affordable housing, without having to tax people to afford it. Um, and that's that's the model I'm testing, and that's going to be the next you know a few decades of my life dedicated to that um, you know, post wonder. So that's 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 me. And my next dream is to educate the world. The remaining four billion people should be educated. And educate the world also that institutions don't matter. Education matters. I agree, I agree with you. That's why I, I want to set this model up because I don't think the education system is fair and should be dictated by how much you pay in local taxes. Uh, it's just the system's messed up in America. And I think that becomes our Achilles heel going forward um, and, and is, a, is the biggest um, you know, areas of weakness I see in the country right now. Uh, and something we can work. And my next dream is to be on a Saturday night live. Do you think I can, I'm the right candidate for that? That was a joke. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, thank you so okay. much. Thank you. I want to talk to Anna Pitrasek. But Mark, it's uh, really uh, a pleasure meeting you in a virtual world. But look forward to meeting you in person. I'll be in New York in April and look forward to meeting you. But before meeting you, I will try the wonder. Okay. And I'm Great. so impressed with that. And Great. I think everyone who's listening should try the wonder because that is what Mark has created. So uh, over to you, Dr. Anna Pitrasek. Okay. I hope I did well. Don't blacklist me for the next webinar. I want to be there. We, we need to invite Mark to come back and tell us more about this fantastic initiative. Whenever you find, you know, a kind of a, you know, time in your schedule, let us know. We'd love to have you back. But he Thank should come with the food. <laughs> and he should bring wonder to Absolutely. Miami. Absolutely. So that, that is something we should do because something like that in Miami will do well. And that will help the economy of Miami get some jobs. And at the same time, bring people some great food while sitting at home. So, so I think we have to convince Mark to bring wonder to Miami. Absolutely. And next time, Mark, when you're in Miami, please visit us. We're uh, one of the largest public universities. We have a lot of students that actually it's the first time that they go to college. They're the first person who is actually going to college. So they would relate a lot to that. A lot of great entrepreneurs, a lot of people with uh, learning entrepreneurial skills. So on behalf of the Pino Global Entrepreneurship Center at Florida International University, we would like to thank you for your time. And for spending this hour with us, this was absolutely fantastic. Deepak, thank you so much. Uh, you're part of uh, FIU, so uh, yeah, that's thank right. you for uh, waking up so tell, early. <laughs> I, I forgot to tell Mark, Mark, don't forget to rate me. They will send you the rating. How was the chairman of the PINO? <laughs> so please rate me. <laughs> okay, no, <that's> sure. <laughs> so, so thank you, Mark. Is I'm a really hard grade. Are you sure you want me to rate you? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that. Good. Thank so, you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Jamie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.